For this lecture, we will investigate the cell cycle. This slide shows a series of micrographs of a cell undergoing division. Cellular division is a very important part of the cell cycle, and we will examine this process in detail. Cells divide to produce more cells, but what are the reasons for producing those additional cells? Reproduction. Asexual reproduction occurs when offspring are produced from a single parent and occurs in single-celled organisms such as this paramecium, as well as multicellular animals such as hydras and sponges. Growth and development. This four-week-old human fetus will grow hundreds of times in size. Cells in the fetus will also need to differentiate into specialized cells, such as muscle and nerve cells, to produce a fully functioning human. And tissue renewal. Cells must be constantly replaced due to cell death. Our skin cells divide about once a day to maintain the external barrier that protects our bodies. There are two main types of cell division. Mitosis is when somatic cells divide and produce identical copies to the parent cell. Meiosis is when gametocytes divide to produce eggs and sperm. We will investigate mitosis first. Here are some somatic cells. Let's take a really close look to see if we can see any liver cells dividing. Here's a close-up of some fictitious liver cells. Most are happy, but if you notice, one is not doing so well. Ooh, and it just died. As cells die, they release a chemical signal so that they can be replaced. The surrounding cells pick up the signal, and this activates cell division. The cell that divides is called the parent cell and the two new cells that result from the division are called daughter cells. These daughter cells are genetically identical to each other and to the parent cell. That means that their DNA contains the same nucleotide sequence. So why is it important for cells produced by mitotic division to be genetically identical? Well, the DNA contains the instructions for how to build a cell. If these instructions are wrong, the cell will not function properly, and there is a lot of DNA in the nucleus. If we laid all the chromosomes in your nucleus from end to end, it would be about one meter in length with a total of three billion base pairs. And that DNA has to be packaged because the nucleus is only about 120 nanometers in diameter. Let's find out how the DNA is packaged. The DNA is first packaged into a nucleosome, which is then further packaged into chromatin. Here's the double strands of DNA, which are wrapped twice around a collection of proteins called histones. The histones occur in a complex of eight molecules. The wrapped DNA plus the histone complex is called a nucleosome. This is a micrograph of DNA wrapped around histones. It looks like beads on a string. Each bead is a nucleosome. If we further coil the nucleosomes in their linking DNA with more proteins, we get highly condensed chromatin. The grainy substance in this micrograph is the chromatin. Chromosomes are sections of DNA that contain the genetic information of an organism. If we look at all the chromosomes of an organism, this totality of genetic information is called the genome. Chromosomes are considered to be the units of cell division as they contain the genetic information that is passed from one generation to the next. This information contained in genes on the chromosomes is specific to certain species. For example, humans have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. On each pair we find a specific sequence of genes that list a series of instructions for how to build specific biological molecules. On different pairs there is a different series of genes. But fruit flies have just eight chromosomes, and corn plants have 20. And each of these species has a specific sequence of genes along their chromosomes. Let's look at the basic features of eukaryotic chromosomes. Like we discussed earlier, genes are found in a specific sequence along the chromosome. These genes contain the instructions for how to make certain products. Telomeres are structures that protect the ends of the chromosome. When chromosomes duplicate, they attach to each other in a region called the centromere. Now it's finally time to talk about the cell cycle. A cell's life or cycle includes many different stages. Cells grow, reproduce, and senesce. Cell division is only a small part of the cell cycle, but it is a very important and highly coordinated part. 
The eukaryotic cell cycle includes interphase and the emphase. Interphase consists of the first gap phase, G1, DNA synthesis, S, and the second gap phase, G2. The emphase consists of mitosis and cytokinesis. So what is happening at each of these points? During the G1 phase of interphase, the cell grows, carries out its normal functions, and produces new organelles to keep up with its increase in size. During the S phase, the chromosomes replicate, which results in a doubling of the amount of genetic material in the nucleus. And in G2, the cell continues its normal functions and prepares to divide. In the M phase, we have cell division. Mitosis refers to the division of the nucleus, while cytokinesis refers to the division of the cytoplasm to make two new daughter cells. If the cell cycle were a period of 12 hours, G1 would be about 5 hours, S would be 4.5 hours, G2 would be 2 hours, and the M phase would be 30 minutes. So what's happening to the DNA at each of these different stages? During G1, the chromosomes exist as chromatin, which, as you remember, is packaged with many different types of proteins. In human cells, there would be 46 of these separate chromatin fibers. In the S phase, the chromosomes replicate. Beginning in G2, the chromosomes start condensing with the help of proteins called cadensins. This occurs because the chromosomes will be moved into the daughter cells during mitosis and must be in a compact form to resist tangling of the fibers and the resulting damage. The duplicated chromosome continues condensing through the first half of mitosis and is typically referred to as a metaphase chromosome during this time. The two copies are joined together at the centromere. And each copy is now called a chromatid. Both copies are called sister chromatids as they have the same DNA sequences. Two chromatids that are not exact copies of the same chromosome are called non-sister chromatids. During mitosis, the chromatids are distributed into the nuclei of the two new daughter cells. Let's look at the steps of mitosis in detail. Remember, mitosis refers to the division of the nucleus. And interphase is not a part of mitosis. It consists of the G1, S, and G2 phases when the cell is performing its regular functions, growing, duplicating its chromosomes, and preparing for division. Mitosis consists of four basic stages prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. This sequence of phases can be easily memorized using the mnemonic PMAT. In the early part of prophase, the chromatin continues condensing, the nuclear envelope disintegrates, and the spindle apparatus forms. The spindle apparatus grows from the centrioles in the animal cell and is composed of microtubules that will attach to the chromosomes. During the last part of prophase, sometimes referred to as prometaphase, the centrioles migrate to opposite poles of the cell as the microtubules attach to the chromatids. The microtubules attach to a specific protein complex on the chromatid called the kinetochore. As you can see from this diagram, associated with each centromere of the duplicated chromosome is the kinetochore, which serves as the microtubule attachment site. Kinetochores and microtubules are not visible in the TEM of the metaphase chromosome on the left. Chromatid orientation is very important, as the microtubules will attach to the sister chromatid facing the pole they originate from. As the spindle nears completion, the microtubules push the sister chromatids to the midplane of the cell. A portion of the spindle microtubules will not attach to the kinetochores of the chromatids, but will later help the cell to elongate. Here's a micrograph of a cell in prophase. Notice that the duplicated chromosomes are faintly visible as units. The spindle apparatus is forming, but the nuclear envelope has not disintegrated completely. In our next phase, metaphase, the spindle apparatus has completely formed, as the sister chromatids are all attached to microtubules and line up in the midplane of the cell. Metaphase is a very obvious stage. As this micrograph shows, the duplicated chromosomes clearly lined up in the center of the cell. In anaphase, the microtubules begin to shorten and pull the sister chromatids towards opposite poles. As you can see in this diagram, the sister chromatid is connected to the spindle microtubule at the kinetochore. If you remember, microtubules have different ends, a plus end and a minus end. The microtubule shortens because the tubulin subunits of the microtubule disassemble at the plus end. 
the microtubule as a whole remains attached to the kinetochore, so the chromatids are pulled towards the pole as the spindle shortens. As this is happening, the non-kinetochore microtubules from each pole have attached and begin to grow by adding more tubulin subunits. This results in elongation of the cell. As shown in this micrograph, anaphase is characterized by the separation of sister chromatids. In telophase, the nuclear envelope reforms around the two new nuclei, the chromosomes begin to uncoil from their mitosis packaging, and the spindle apparatus disappears. Telophase is also the time in which cytokinesis begins. But remember, cytokinesis is a part of the emphase, but not part of mitosis. You can see in this micrograph that the spindle is still visible, but the chromosomes are unraveling in two newly formed nuclei. Cytokinesis, or division of the cytoplasm, is also clearly underway. So let's talk more about cytokinesis. It is when two new cells are created to house the two new nuclei formed during mitosis. As stated earlier, the timing varies in different cell types, but usually begins during telophase. And the process is quite different when we compare animal and plant cells. In animal cells, there is a ring of microfilaments just beneath the plasma membrane in the midplane of the cell. This ring contracts as the microfilaments shorten, finally pinching the cell in two. And we have two distinct daughter cells, each with a nucleus. This micrograph of cytokinesis shows the two daughter cells nearly separated. As the microfilaments contract, a cleavage furrow forms. In plant cells, cytokinesis is different due to the cell walls that encircle the plasma membrane. Instead of pinching, the plant cell must form a new cell wall between the newly formed nuclei. Vesicles filled with carbohydrates unite along the midplane, eventually forming a solid wall to separate the two new daughter cells. This micrograph shows the vesicles that will form the new cell wall. But we have not discussed cell division for prokaryotes. If you will remember, bacteria have circular chromosomes, and they do not have a membrane-bound nucleus, but do have a region where the chromosome is found called the nucleoid. Bacteria divide by binary fission. So in bacteria, the circular chromosome replicates and moves towards either pole of the cell. Then a ring of protein called TFSZ contracts to split the cell in two. How does a cell know when to enter the emphase and start dividing? Like everything else in cells, it has something to do with enzymes. Special enzymes called cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs, regulate the progression of the cell cycle. These kinases are active when they bind to proteins called cyclins, and this complex of kinase and cyclin is called the mitosis promoting factor, or MPF. When concentrations of MPF increase during interphase, the cell enters the emphase. Why? Well, the CDK part of this factor adds a phosphate to other proteins that initiate mitosis. But everything must be correct in the cell for mitosis to occur. There are three major checkpoints in the cell cycle. Some cells do not divide once they mature and enter a state called G0. But cells that do divide encounter their first checkpoint between G1 and S. For the cell to continue to the S phase, it must be large enough to divide, it must have enough nutrients to fuel DNA synthesis, division must be necessary due to the correct social signals, and the DNA must be undamaged. If the DNA is damaged beyond repair, a protein called P53 will activate genes to stop the cell cycle, and the cell will be programmed to die. This cellular suicide is called apoptosis. But if the DNA is good, and the other conditions are met, the DNA duplicates and the cell comes to its next checkpoint. The cell cannot enter the M phase until the chromosomes have replicated correctly and the cyclins have bound to the CDKs to produce the mitosis promoting factor. If these conditions are met, the cell cycle progresses until metaphase. To move into anaphase, the cell must have the sister chromatids all lined up along the midplane and each one attached to the spindle. If this is not correct, proteins will prevent the separation of the chromatids. Cancer results when the checkpoints do not function properly and the cell divides uncontrollably.